Okay? I'm going to introduce our next speaker, but I want to first of all say thank you. It's what a pleasure it is to be the head of higher education for Kentucky and to be a part of this conversation. But I thank you because you are where the rubber meets the road. And without a doubt, I've been to many of your campuses multiple times, but would love to visit you more. And uh, if you do, you have to buy me stuff. But, but still, uh, I appreciate us being a partner with you. Our next speaker is Dan Ash, and he's the research director for the Graduate Network's Bridging the Talent Gap Employer and Employee Engagement Initiative. And I have to tell you, I've, I work with Beth Davidson in this state on doing things, and what, a, uh, what an excellent resource she is in Kentucky, and I'm happy to be her partner too. He's an expert in workplace psychology and training and program development. Dr. Ash served as the founding executive director of Metropolitan College, a partnership between UPS, the University of Louisville, and Jefferson Community and Technical College. Since its inception in 1998, Metropolitan College has become a national and international model for education and business partnerships, receiving extensive media coverage on CNN, the Chronicle of Higher Education, the New York Times, U.S. News and World Reports, and the Wall Street Journal. Today, he will discuss effective employer partnerships and facilitate a panel of employers. Welcome, Dr. Ash. And let's all give Dr. Thompson a big round of applause. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. I really do appreciate that. And good morning, everyone. It's great to be back in Kentucky. I ran away from Kentucky about four years ago and uh, live in Colorado now. So it feels so good to be back home and to see the trees again. There are no trees in the high desert, or very few to speak of. Uh, and thank you, panelists. I'll be introducing them in a moment. Uh, but first, I want us to start with a couple of uh, strong ideas in mind. Let's start with the 1.2 million people in Kentucky who do not have, they may have started, they may have never, never started, but do not have a degree. And I'll ask you a question that I know everyone is going to know the answer to, whether you've done the research or not. What is the number one motivation for people who do not have a degree to want to return to or start a degree. We know that the answer to that is that they want to improve their jobs. They want to get a better job. They want to go to a better employer. Whatever it is, it is work-related. It is through the lens of work that they do this. That's the number one reason. Our research bears that out, and virtually everyone's bears that out, that that is the number one reason. Now, that is going to be done through us as educators partnering with employers. This is the one time over the, the, these two days that you get to hear firsthand from employers and from business experts what we need to do to do what? To be able to improve or create partnerships between employers and higher education of some sort. Now, when this is done right, it is truly a magnificent experience. The, uh, as Dr. Thompson mentioned, uh, you know, in my involvement with Metropolitan College, I just looked this up before uh, I came up here, and over 10,000 individuals basically in the Louisville area have now completed their degrees through Metropolitan College with no cost whatsoever. UPS has greatly benefited from this, Kentucky has benefited from this, and more importantly, those individuals who have gone through that program have benefited. So when partnerships work, it's great, which then brings me to the starting point for our panelists. When partnerships work, it's great, so why is it the case, and uh, with Bridging the Talent Gap, we've now been in, I've uh, forgotten bridges, like 21, 22 different cities around the uh, country. Uh, we have over 3,500 employers in our database at this point. And 
when we ask them, do you want to partner, or would you be interested in partnering with a, um, uh, and these are from employers, with a local college or university, uh, it is a, the same response over and over again across the country. 85% say yes. They are interested, they're definitely interested, they want to find out more. But only 15 to 20% of these employers actually have a partnership. We need to ask ourselves why that is the case. And that is sort of our starting point with our panelists. So let me introduce who you're going to be hearing from this morning. Beth, you're the closest to me, so I'm going to start with you. <laughs> and it's great to see you again, Beth. <laughs> Beth Davison is the founding executive director of the Kentucky Chamber Workforce Center. The Workforce Center is part of the, the um, philanthropic arm of the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce, the state's largest association advocating on behalf of business. Beth joined the chamber in 2017 to begin building the Workforce Center as its only fully dedicated employee. Since then, the center has grown to, t to a team of nine and continues to expand their support to employers and efforts in building a stronger workforce. Beth is a lifelong resident of Kentucky, earning her undergraduate degree from the University of Kentucky and an MBA from Sullivan University. She has spent the last 10 plus years advocating for workforce in Kentucky and the nation's capital and aligning talent to the strategic plans of business. Beth was honored as a top 40 under 40 and named a top 20 people to know in human resources by Business First Louisville. Previous employers include Greater Louisville, Inc., the Oliver Group, and Sullivan University. Beth also serves as a Workforce Readiness Chair for the Kentucky Society for Human Resource Management. Let's welcome Beth this morning. Todd, and you're going to you need to help me with your last name. Schmiedler. Now, uh, as a person whose last name is Ash, I greatly appreciate the need to say the name correctly. So, I, I, you know, and you can imagine growing up with the last name of Ash, you know, and how cruel kids were, you know, to, you know. I won't share what they said. Okay, a little bit about Todd. Todd serves as Trilogy Health, Service, Health Services, excuse me, Senior Vice President of Foundation and Workforce Development. Todd provides leadership for the workforce development, Trilogy Foundation, Live a Dream Foundation, employee well-being, and community outreach. Wow. Trilogy provides senior living services across 115 Midwest campuses with 16,000 employees. The Trilogy Foundation has increased its impact by awarding 2,994 scholarships in 2019. That's up from 25 scholarships in 2010. Way to go. And 1,687 Employee Emergency Assistance Awards in 2019, up from 41 awards in 2010. Most recently, Todd has developed and implemented the Trilogy Apprentice Programs that include CNA, Culinary, Hospitality, Life Enrichment. These programs are DOL approved with 6,000 plus, plus employees enrolled. They've awarded 4,727 certifications in 2019, making it the largest healthcare apprentice program in the U.S. and the largest employer-based apprentice program in their four states. In June 2019, Trilogy also launched its Trilogy Promise program with free tuition, way to go, for all full-time and part-time employees at Purdue Global's 170 degrees, 526 Trilogy employees have enrolled. Let's welcome Todd this morning. And we have Tim Ernst here this morning. He's a human resources professional with 25 years of experience. I'm sure hoping that we draw from that, uh, Tim. He has worked in healthcare, manufacturing, distribution, and construction. He has a BA and MA from Western Kentucky University and, and completed doctoral studies in human resources and leadership development at the University of Louisville. He and his wife have been married 20 years. Congratulations, that's an accomplishment. And have three children and two grandchildren, even more accomplishments. He also has, really, three cats. 
That's pretty good. Let's welcome Tim this morning. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you have a mic. Good. Okay. So let's start with the ideas of partnership. And I would really like for each of you to reflect about uh, uh, this whole notion of employers are really interested in, a vast majority of them are interested in saying, yes, we want to work with local colleges and universities. They want some kind of formal relationship with them, yet only about 15% actually do so. Help us understand that. And Beth, maybe, are you willing to start with this yeah. question? Great. Take off. Well, thank you, Dan, and excited to be on the stage today with you all. Um, you know, I really appreciate it. I came a bit early and got to hear Dr. Thompson's charge to you all around the priorities for education. And it just reminded me that, you know, as the Kentucky Chamber, that's our very similar charge to business, is that this is a two-way relationship between employers and education. And for a long time, we've built a system where we put K through 12 here, we put post-secondary here, and we put employers here. And that's not worked for years in a very global, um, technologically changing economy and society that we live in. And so when we think about the notion of changing completely a culture that's built off of these very divided lines, it was exciting to see the charge for you all to work with employers but I would say we also owe you that same. And when we built the Workforce Center, it was with that in mind, to get employers to the table, to take action, to work with educators, to build the workforce that they need. And when we think about this notion of comebackers and their need to upskill, which is definitely the word of the day and the need <laughs> of the day, um, we have to have employers at the table. But I know that what we do, I have a background in HR, I've hired people, we take old job descriptions, we put a couple fresh bullet points on the end, and then we post them out. And if that's your source of knowing what we need, shame on us. <laughs> and so when you think of these employers that are willing or want to take action with you that the surveys show, mm -hmm. Dan, when we did that same survey back in 2016, we also showed that employers are leaving 50% of their tuition benefits right. on the table. So there's, a, there's been a real mismatch between what employers are saying that they need, which is an upskill, but then how they're talking to their own employees about how they can grow and advance their careers through education. And so we've worked really hard to kind of change this as a culture. I'm excited that you're gonna to get to hear from two employers that are the top 5% in our state that know how to attempt to change this. But what we are working with at the chamber is taking the conversation to employers and getting their signals out of what it is that they actually need, what their demand is, what that competency, skill, and requirement is for those positions, and that where they find bottlenecks in the system that they can go to work for. So I think it's, it's a two-way conversation for sure. I think employers have to be at the table. They have to be actively engaged, but they have to see the return on investment for doing that and that what the outcome would be for the bottom line of their business. So I'll kind of stop there. And Great. Good morning. I want to warn you two things. First off, I'm battling the Kentucky allergies, so if I have to clear my throat, I apologize up front. <laughs> uh, second thing is, I'm extremely opinionated. <laughs> uh, and I have several friends in this room, and they will attest to it. Uh, so I'll start by saying this. I, I think that today Mary Gwen just raised her hand. Uh, <laughs> You know, I'll start by saying that, you know, so I've been a Trilogy for nine years now, and, and we do value education. So much so that I think we're in a transition that at first when, when I got there, I used to say that we're a servant leader-based company that happens to be serving seniors. And that is absolutely true. That's our, that's our foundation building block. But now I believe that we're a servant leader-based company that educates and serves seniors. Because the reality is for us, our business starts with high-quality, caring employees. That is literally the first thing in our flywheel to success, and we focus extensively on it. So much so that, that Dan was very gracious to do the introduction. We do have the largest apprentice program in healthcare in the United States after two years. We scale. I will tell you the first six years, nobody believed it. Nobody believed that we could scale. 
Every time I went to them and I said, I'm telling you, I will scale this thing. I need to have a different approach. The approach where I pay per person is a failure on both of our parts. Hmm. Both of us. It can't continue because you cannot scale. You're actually, that model is actually stopping scaling because I am not incentivized to scale then. And that's one of the broken pieces of what's going on in education and in the workforce. I do all you can eat deals or I don't do them anymore. So I want everybody in. We have a thing where I called it democratizing opportunities. You know, why is it that employees on the third shift or minorities or people who are first time college goers or s single parents, people that we know have barriers, why is it that they are negatively impacted by the programs that we have that are equally shared? There were challenges that we have to face internally and the opportunity for us is to partner with schools and with systems that want to do something in a more creative but effective way. I'll give one example. So we have a culinary apprentice program, roughly, if I had to guess right now, about 1,500 employees in, in our culinary apprentice program. It's our second largest program behind Nurse Aid. Nurse Aid is the first stepping stone to nursing. And that promise that we used to make in, higher, in healthcare about if you come be a nurse aide, we'll get you in a nursing school is a lie. And, and anybody that doesn't believe that, I'll show you the stats, okay? It's not that we don't want it. It's just, it's not there for a lot of those people. I've got 3,500 nurse aide apprentices. Do you think I have 3,500 spots in nursing schools that I'm gonna get them into? And I'm small in the scale of things. And so, but our culinary program, we partnered with an outside group, very credible. We don't do anything that's not national recognized industry certifications or college certifications that were created online on demand. So we have a pro partner, their name is Ruby. They do all of the certifications for Marriott, Ritz Carlton, Whole Foods, to just name a few. They are legit. We went to JCTC and we said, look, we're gonna put a lot of people through this. Can you crosswalk this? Because we don't want it to stop there. We literally named our apprentice track. I mean, the, it's four certifications, uh, Culinary 101, Culinary 102, Culinary 201, Culinary 202. Why do you think we did that? Getting people who otherwise would not see that they can handle college to begin to believe that they could. So we've had, in the first year, we had 19 people get through that program, and I thought it's a complete failure. <laughs> we doubled down. Last year, we had 211 people get through that program. JCTC crosswalked those, that, that curriculum, all of those online modules, which were a lot, for 26 hours of college credit, including OJT, you know, because we do uh, on-the-job competencies also, 26 hours toward their culinary uh, associates in apprenticeship and culinary studies. That's a 64-hour degree. You should be clapping. If you're JCTC, yeah. thank you. That, look, those people would not go in that next step without being able to do the first step. The first step was on us and on finding a provider who could make it easy and efficient and effective for them to be able to get through that program. And we have the leaders on the campus to be able to support them. We have the support system. And our foundation provided almost 3,000 scholarships last year. We had over 500 people in seven months. Seven months, we launched a program for free tuition for all full and part-time employees. In seven months, we had over 500 employees enrolled in start classes. Don't tell me there aren't people who want to do it. Yeah. We got to break down the barriers, and sometimes that means we got to be entrepreneurial together. Great. Thank you. Good morning. So I'm in the construction industry. Construction today is where nursing was back in the early 90s. Hmm. We're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, my foreman and my superintendents are looking for somebody to walk through the door that can take a set of plans, yep, and go do it. It's not going to happen. 
It didn't surprise me when I heard the statistic that 34% of Kentucky's population is 25 years or older. By show of hands, how many of you in here knew exactly what you wanted to do when you graduated high school at the age of 18? <laughs> you mean by a non-show of hands? Yeah. <laughs> In the construction industry, I've got people walking through the door at 23, 24, and 25 years of age, and they're coming to me for a career because they've had a life-changing event. Their girlfriend became their wife. They now have 1.2 children, whatever the case. Mm -hmm. And they've got to have a career. I partnered with the Kentucky Community uh, College and Technical System because this was not something that I could do by myself. Uh, we started a program called Jefferson Build. Jefferson Build is a program where I can take uh, construction professionals and over one year, they're going to learn some of the basics, carpentry, blueprint reading, uh, some leadership classes, plumbing, HVAC. So they kind of get a smattering of a cross-section of what we do in construction. They graduate with 28 hours. By the way, this is all paid for with the Work Ready Scholarship. Yeah. And for those that don't qualify, we pick up the tab. The only thing we ask for is give me two years afterwards. Yeah. These guys had the opportunity that when they finish this degree to roll into my two-year apprenticeship. I have a, a, an apprenticeship in carpentry that's been approved through the state of Kentucky. Um, I'm in the processes of working on one uh, for pre-engineered metal buildings. I'm also in the processes of working on one for, for concrete. We're a family-owned construction company that's been around since 1977, and our business has had to evolve out of a need to evolve. You referenced the 2008 economy and what happened. <clears throat> I look at our construction practitioners or our construction professionals, and it's about approach. It's not about let's get you into college and get you a degree. It's about let's make you better construction professionals. I'm going to hire you for the skill sets that you bring to the table but I want to make you better, stronger, faster. Oh, by the way, you're going to have a degree when you finish yeah. at no cost. Yeah. One of the other points that I'll bring up, um, I graduated in 95 and 97 and then again in 2000. I wasn't smart enough to stop going. <laughs> um, anybody remember that first time on campus when you had to enroll? go here and fill this form out. Now I need you to go over here to this office. And then you go to that office and it's like, wait, wait, no, 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 you don't need to come here. You need to go over there first <laughs> because there are these two forms you got to go get before you come back over here. But once you go over there and get those two forms, you can come back over here. We've got to simplify that process. <laughs> that turns off so many adult learners today. It's frustrating. That process has got to be simplified. You know, I work with a segment of the population that is a lower, econ lo lower socioeconomic status. A lot of these individuals go, they went to trade schools. Trade schools have changed, uh, like the Arvin Center in, in Oldham County. They're not called the trade schools anymore because trade schools had this negative connotation. This is where the dumb kids went. This is where the problem children went. This is where the people that just, you can't do it, so this is where we're going to put you. I've got guys and gals that we're putting through construction math classes and they'll come down and talk to me and I'll go, man, I can't do math. Really? You figure rock tonnage, you figure rebar tonnage, you know, you figure yeah. area. Whether you know it or not, you're doing math. So it's about giving them the confidence to, and to understand that regardless of where you come from, yeah, you can do it. Is it something that I'm passionate about? I got goosebumps talking about this. Yeah, I'm very passionate about it. Hold on to the mic. Um, uh, so just in reflecting upon what all three of you have said, you are firmly in the place of partnering with colleges and you have a substantial amount of experience in doing this. Here is your chance to tell a group that is really ready to hear it. What is it that colleges and universities are doing right in working with you? And just as important, what is it that colleges and universities are doing wrong 
that they need to somehow change. And you have the mic, so let's go ahead and start with you, Tim. So I'll resort back to my days in radio. W-I-I-F-M. <laughs> What's in it for me? That question is still as relevant today as it has ever been. Businesses don't know what businesses don't know. Hmm. We're looking for you to, when we partner, when we come together, it's help me understand. How do we get this partnership off the ground? What does it look like? What's it going to cost me? Um, you know, bottom line, you know, what are the benefits? Um, you know, I'm fortunate enough that I work for a, a president and a CEO, the owners of the company, that have vision. You know, I've worked in businesses where the proof is in the pudding. You've got to be able to prove yourself in order to, to say that something is effective or not. Um, you know, the reason that we partner with the Kentucky Community and Technical College System is because we're seeing results. You know, I've got my first group of, I've got my first group of students that went through this uh, session in the fall semester. Um, these, uh, these were individuals that, you know, if you ask them what was their high school career like, they really didn't have a lot of positive things to say. They're passing classes at the college level. <laughs> I've got people coming to me. So the first time through, I went out and had to handpick people. I've got people coming to me now going, uh, what, what, what do I have to do to be a part of that? That looks like fun. The analogy that I use is, you know, why, why are they eating filet mignon and we're still eating hamburger? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me show you. So, you know, one of the things I would say, you know, obviously simplify the enrollment process, simplify mm -hmm. the financial aid process, um, get businesses to understand what's in it for them. Mm -hmm. um, I work with a lot of the trade schools, um, a lot of the high schools. Um, I've got some of the carpentry instructors coming to me and we're sitting down and having conversations about how can we take our curriculum to better fit what you all do? You know, we, we really want to truly partner. We want to make sure that these students that graduate as seniors have a place to go. And that's something that we're really looking for. Great. So I would say two things right off the bat. Um, number one, we have a lot of great partnerships now. Uh, I do believe it's unfair that, you know, if we want to change this, we have to make it easier for a lot more companies to do it. We've gotten to where we're public enough and big enough to where we're leveraging that to get the relationships because now schools are coming to us saying, how do we get all these people? How do we get these 3,000 scholarships? How do we get this stuff? So. It, to your point, I, I'll tell you that you, Metro College, Metro Uni, uh, Metro University, incredible. Okay, but why is it just UPS? That's the question I've been asking for 20 years yeah. now. Keep going. And, and so, I, you know, I look at that and I'd say there's two things. Number one, we have a language understanding issue. Yeah. You know, we say something, you say something. We are close, but not the same. And as a result of that, until you can get to the point where you actually understand each other, there's going to be consistent disappointment and misunderstandings. And in a misunderstanding, it looks like one party is not fulfilling the promise that they made in the arrangement. And I don't think that is actually what's going on. I think a lot of times we don't understand each other. And, and so I think to, you know, to our point, I have a founder and CEO, you know, who is very supportive too. And, you know, I had zero experience. I literally had never walked into a nursing home in my entire life when he offered me a job. Mm -hmm. You know, and so sometimes it takes on our part and your part to have somebody on the outside be in the inside of your organization who somebody will say, I'm going to believe enough in them to help guide us down this pathway and partner in a way that may not be seen. One other thing I'll mention is we announced last week that a $10 million investment across the state in high schools that, uh, for work-based learning. Well, that means really I'm hiring 200 high school, committing to hire 200 high school students a year for the next five years. You know, I go to, to certain partners and I tell them, all right, a large percentage of them are going to be juniors and seniors that we're going to certify up in the nurse aid track so that they are more qualified, more ready to go to nursing school and they'll actually know what they're getting into as opposed to thinking it's like Grey's Anatomy. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so the likelihood that you're going to have a qualified student who's going to make it through a two or four year program is much more likely. And they're going to continue to work part time. We're going to work on their schedule. They're going to have supportive people, preceptors and mentors who are supporting them through that process. Now, here's the kicker is for you and I, that all sounds really good. Okay. But when you talk to a student, you know what they think? I don't know that I can get into nursing school. Yeah. So what is my thing is right now I'm on a path. I'm going to get some spots in nursing schools. I'm going to get some because I'm going to guarantee I'm going to pay for it. Now, that means I also have to get some new thought in the State Board of Nursing. You know, we have to adapt in the systems. I know that there are limitations that you have that you say, well, that's a State Board of Nursing problem. That's a this problem. That's a that problem. Together, my goal if I have to, take over the State Board of Nursing. Of nursing. <laughs> because if we don't change those fundamental building blocks that are stopping us collectively, there are other people that stop us. Okay? We have to at least be willing to pilot things. And if you have a relationship, like I leverage my personal relationship. Those that know me in this room, if I say I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. <laughs> I mean, I'm putting $8 million dollars out in education this year. And one last thing, tuition reimbursement, complete failure. Yep. If, you, if you're going out marketing to companies on tuition reimbursement, you got something that you don't see, okay? They don't use that because millennials and Zs don't want it. They don't want to be handcuffed. And I appreciate that they're going to work two years from you, for you. I don't have any work requirement after they do. As long as they're with me, I pay for them. And all the way through, and I've got in Purdue Global, I got 6% of those 500 people, around 32 people who are in a criminal justice degree. What's the likelihood that I'm going to have a job for them in criminal justice? Not likely. I'm going to love them anyway. Because while they're going through that process, they're going to love my residents because they felt loved. And I'm not worried about whether or not I've got them for another two years. I'm worried about whether they're giving quality service to the elderly who are fragile and vulnerable. And then I made a promise to their, themselves and their family that we would take good care, not for them, but not just for them, but about them. And you can't do that if the employee doesn't feel loved. And we do this across 16,000. The other thing I'd say is you got to scale again to me. You, you, these small little programs, I'm not interested. The lieutenant governor for Ohio called me last week after our announcement, literally on my cell phone, and said, how do we do this same thing in Ohio? And he said, how do I get a partnership with some of these community colleges that you have? You know, and I said, your problem, gov lieutenant governor, is that you've got a system that makes it hard. I got to go to 23 different colleges to get 23 different arrangements. All these things, it's too complicated for me. It's not worth it. I'll just partner with JCTC. I'll partner with Ivy Tech. And you know what? It doesn't matter because that culinary degree, I've got people in Michigan taking classes at JCTC right now. Yeah. There's one class, a lab, that they're going to have to do. And you know what we're doing? We're cohorting them and boot camping them in Louisville for a week. I'm taking a whole week and I'm paying for them to come down here, stay in a hotel, and for a week they're going to be in that lab. We have got to find solutions to issues, and it can't just be because of one-offs. The numbers speak. We have to do more than just one or two people. We've got to find solutions that hit populations of people. Yeah, great. I mean, did you all get the right employers on this stage with these two <laughs> no. or what? <laughs> no. I kind of feel like I'm going to church. I'm really appreciative of the leadership that you see on the stage. And I've, I've been around their work, so I know of it. And I'm just honored that you all get to hear it directly from them. And this is the stories that we need to hear. This is the truth that we need to hear. We also have to think about systematic change. And most companies in Kentucky are small to medium size. Yep. So we need this to become the rule, not the exception. And one of the ways we really think about that in Kentucky is through our talent pipeline management system. We launched this initiative 13 months ago. So that businesses of all shapes and sizes, no matter where they are in the Commonwealth, can get plugged in to building stronger talent pipelines. And in the last 13 months, we've now got hundreds of employers tapping into this system, and they're scaling out talent pools and populations for over 14,000 positions. Mm -hmm. And so what that looks like is really working with employers to get to the truths of what they need, the number of what they need, 
the competencies and skills that are required in those positions, where they're getting those schools of talent, so they can build those supply chains up faster and stronger and quicker. And I'll give you an example of this. I'm, I'll can cheer on Todd. Um, but with our healthcare talent pipeline group here in Louisville, they're really focused on registered nurses. And what we found through this process is that Louisville is producing 1,000 nurses less a year than what the employers in the community need. That's mm. assuming that all these RNs are staying here, which we know is not happening. So when they backed that in further, they really started to understand what competencies were required. And I cheered on education in these moments because what they found was the number one competency that was defined was customer service, bedside manner. What do you think the educators did when they heard that? Thank you. We can put this into our classrooms. Yeah. They dug further. And when we looked at the capacity of the post-secondary educators in this community, we looked at that big deficit of 1,000 production of registered nurses every year. And they said, we'd love to have fuller classrooms. We once upon a time did. But to be honest, we have no rotation sites. We need clinical rotations open. We also don't have enough teachers. And putting students through the programs is expensive. Todd, again, and his cohort of other healthcare employers here in the community said, listen, if you look at 15% of our upcoming retirees, we could open almost 30 more uh, rotation sites. So looking at talent like supply chain, showing employers that if they show up and that there can be a return on investment for getting talent through their pipeline faster, using meaningful resources that they have to make that happen is, is so critical to the conversation. And not being as scared of that innovation is really important. Um, on top of that, you know, I was at OCTC, I see Charmy here, a couple weeks ago. And there is so much need to innovate in this space. You know, they've really taken some stabs through their Go Careers programs, whether it's putting women in manufacturing pipelines or looking at financial institutions and working at employers. What they do, though, is they, they, they grind to make this happen. They come up with grants. They, ha they create career success coaches. And really, really handhold and stair-step that process so that they can innovate and experiment and then see how they, they can scale it. And I can't preach on that enough that both the employers have to have that opportunity to come to the table and innovate and understand where their responsibilities are as we build a brand new infrastructure that can support employers and educators working together, but measuring it giving employers that time to get their facts straight, to understand what they really need, and then digging into the right education and trainers to fill those pipelines. So I've, hold on to that just for a moment. So um, if I can begin to boil down what all of you have been saying, uh, which I think are really important messages that we all need to take home in here. Uh, one is make things simpler. Please, let's make things simpler. Not only in just the process, uh, as soon as you, who was it that was describing um, registration? So I immediately looked out at you, Randy, and I've, I was wondering if you remember the arena registration days where we would move, and we would have these meetings where we would move large numbers of students from one room to the next and try to figure out how do we get 300 people into this room, and they put their schedule together, then they go to another room to see what classes were closed. Then we have a side room where we say, okay, now they've got to do their schedule all over again. Then they've got to go back to the room before to see which room. I mean, it just went on and on. It was, I always use it as a way to cheat because I would say, oh, this professor said I could get into this class and, you know, let them get through. So, but, there's, but making things simpler is one thing. Um, I heard you really resonate, uh, Beth, with the notion of don't be afraid to innovate. You know, be, be willing to really listen to what is out there and then be able to act on it in ways that may not have been done before. And then I finally heard, and this, this really warmed the cockles of my heart because I totally agree with it, is that um, we need to learn one another's language. And we need to learn it in a way, I mean, it, it always um, was interesting with me when we went through Metropolitan College and, and began it, is how that emerged time and again. And I ended up needing to meet with frontline supervisors at UPS for over a year explaining higher education and how it, how it functioned. Uh, we have time for just a few more comments from you, and I want to do a quick run-through because I think there are 
there are many different things that we need to hear from you, but two things that have, that have emerged that I'm really interested in hearing from you. Help us understand what the heck is upskilling. Because, I, and around the country, I've been finding out this when I ask people in different cities, I get different answers no matter where I go. So help us understand the difference between upskilling and just learning, okay? And then begin to alert us in here, and again, just some short comments, begin to alert us to the ways that automation and the changing work world is affecting you because we as in higher education need to be on the front line with you to adjust to this huge change that is happening. So, you know, how's automation affecting you? How are all those things? So quick responses so that we have some time for questions. Beth, start. Yeah, I, I think you can't think about automation and technological advances without upskilling. They're, they're, they're really putting the pressure on each other in our, our talent marketplace. And when you think of upskilling, it's how do you think about our new world that we live in, which is earn and learn, go earn and learn, go earn and learn, go earn and learn. You know, getting away from the traditional went to college, back and work now. We're not there anymore. And so that's changed our system to become an education and employer system where we are educating, then working, then educating, or at the same time. And so when you think about that, on top of technology, rapidly disrupting our workplace every single day, getting clear signals from employers. They are gonna know first how those technological advancing, advances are disrupting the workplace, and then you all then need those signals. We can't wait a year, because if you wait a year to get those signals, there's a new change, and we need a new upskill. And so the way that we look at that is we look at critical positions, and then we look at what positions are feeding those critical roles that employers need. And then we take a toe back at the line, backfill those upskill positions, train based on the technology that is of today, and then you continue to upskill your employees. Great. That would be my very short. Great, thanks. So two quick responses. Number one is I have the good fortune to, to teach one class at U of L MBA program every year around healthcare strategy. And here's what I tell the class. And I think this is regarding technology is my job is not to teach you. If you came for me to teach you, you're making a mistake. My job is to give you an opportunity to learn, you know, I, and you know, I think that that is our answer about how technology and industry, you know, the things that are shifting in our industry are, I can't tell, I mean, I'm getting ready to put autonomous scan, you know, uh, sensors into three of our buildings to pilot. Okay, next year I might be doing complete robots around doing certain things. It can't, you're never gonna keep up with that if you don't understand that it's about teaching, giving somebody an opportunity to learn as the function that is part of what our responsibility is. I think the second thing is this, is that, you know, the upskilling is really simple to me. Give me an opportunity to increase my knowledge and skills and then show I'm competent in it. Great. It's not rocket science. We did that 6,742 times in the last two years through our apprentice programs alone. That meant 6,742 pay raises. Hmm. Okay, you wanna know why they're willing to do it? It's because <laughs> everyone gets them something between a quarter and a dollar fifty an hour. And they spend a little time here to learn more and then they feel like a million bucks. And the other thing that we do, we have a party for our employees every month at every lo <laughs> location. We celebrate, they get a certificate after everything and we celebrate as a family because that encourages people who may not have seen it before that they could do it, that if, if Sally can do it, maybe I can do it. And then Sally becomes the champion in the facility it has to be peer related, not just from above. Yeah, great. Excellent points. In the construction industry, I'm dealing with a population that will leave for 50 cents more on the hour. Hmm. So as skills grow, you put more money in their pocket, bottom line, and you celebrate that success. We train people to be jacks of all trades. I might hire you to be a carpenter. You're going to learn concrete. You're going to learn rebar. You're going to learn pre-engineered metal buildings. I am going to make you better, stronger, faster. Technology is changing the world that we live in. The generations are changing the world that we live in. We have to be able to adapt. Uh, this millennial generation and Gen Z generation that are coming into our workforce are, are unlike anything we've ever seen before. If you're green, you grow. If you're ripe, you rot. You've got to constantly want to grow. You've got to constantly want to change. 
Mark Twain said it best, the only person that likes change is a baby in a wet diaper. <laughs> the society that we live wait in today... Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> That's too good it's to yours, you can use quickly. It. <laughs> the society that we live in today is all predicated on change. We have to be willing to change if we are going to be successful, not only as a business, but as a group of educators. No. Yeah. So, not about Mark Train. Uh, you know, we talk about millennials and Zs, and just so you know, that's more than 55% of our workforce right now at, at our company. Okay. Here's the thing: is a, a survey last week came out from a Zapper. Okay, did a survey with millennials and with Zs. And the average time that they want to spend at an employer, millennials, was 10 years. They said, I want to stay for 10 years with this employer. And Z's were six years. Mm -hmm. What we have to do, that's the importance of upskilling and then taking that upskilling and partnering with you guys either on creating the curriculum and the knowledge and the relationship, because that's the other piece of this, is that as we're upskilling, I'm creating a relationship for them with somebody. I'd like it to be you, but if it's not you, then it'll be some national association who says I'm willing to put these things in a format that is more engaging than what it is in a classroom. Right. Great. So just to cap what I'm hearing all of you say, and I'm going to borrow from uh, some conversation that I've had with Parminder Jassel. Many of you know Parminder in here. Um, I'm hearing all of you say that we are no longer in a knowledge-based economy. That's an idea that I think emerged a few decades ago, and we have changed. We are no longer in a knowledge-based economy. We are in a new learning economy. There is a continual need for us to learn, a continual need for us to upskill, that sort of thing, and we've got to grasp that idea. Uh, will you please help me in thanking these great spokespersons here for it? And we do have a couple of minutes, I think. Is that right, Kathy? We have three minutes. If there are any questions, there is a mic up here. And this young lady here is. Hello, I work with a um, competency-based healthcare leadership program at the University of Louisville. And I do have adult students that want to accelerate, but they're often limited by their tuition reimbursement. Mm. Um, and the city is usually three to 5,000, which basically makes them part-time students. Um, do you have any suggestions on what that student should do? The times that I've suggested that they've gone to their employer or they're afraid to even <laughs> um, to ask for more or they're told it's with it, that's all we can do in the budget for this year. Do you have any suggestions on how those students might go to their employer and ask for an accelerated tuition reimbursement? I, I'm going to give you an answer you're probably not going to like. <laughs> it's not their job, it's yours. You know, it, it, because one-offs going to employers is, is not going to work, folks. If you know this is an, a challenge, we have to reshape on our part as a collective group. That's what I did by going to Purdue Global. I didn't make, I didn't go out to 50 different people. I found one person who was willing to hit my number, okay? And no employer can give over $5,250 for education benefit without it being a taxable event to the employee, and I will not do that. Okay, because at the end of the year, I gave $1 above that, all of a sudden they've got a $1,000 tax bill. You think they're happy with me even if I got them a cheap education? They ain't happy with the $1,000 right. that used to go come into their pocket and now it's being spent out. And so we've gotta be more aggressive about that collectively and not tell them what to do. We need to go out and find the pockets and one by one find the pockets of employers and then find the people who wanna do it, just like I'm finding the, the education partners and you find the right employers, and if they won't do it at where they're going, tell them to go to some place who will. Yeah, and to, to, amplify, to amplify what you're saying, Todd, the, we're getting ready to uh, work with an initiative in Detroit where they, are, they have actually selected that as one of the community uh, measures. So they're identifying what is it that employers are providing for their workers at this juncture, 
and then they're, they're establishing a community goal of increasing it by a certain percentage to address the very issue that you're talking about. So I think it's one that bears some discussion at this point. But again, it is on a, it is on a larger scale. Yeah, you've yeah. got to create the groundswell. Um, I've, I'm a big believer. I've gone to CEOs and asked questions before, and they're like, no, nah, we're not going to do that. Okay. So then I go back to the employees, and one becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, becomes 16, and that groundswell, all of a sudden the CEO's coming back to me and going, do uh, you remember that thing we were talking about? <laughs> what, what, what do we need to do to get that off the ground? Yeah. Beth, any comments? I, I, I think they nailed it. They nailed it. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Perfect timing. It is time for, is it time for a break? Is that the next thing? It's time for Kathy. Again, thank you, panelists. We really appreciate your time.